tell you the rest of the story. Um, good. So we're here for the second, the second part of the, the protein production in microbes lecture. Um, today, we're, we, so last time, we covered most of, of sort of the standard. for designing and troubleshooting um, protein production strategies, right? So we've covered useful, ba which bacteria to use, right? Um, protein production bacteria, including useful bacterial vectors, how those, and, and, and expression vectors. We've looked at inducible expression driven by a couple of different types of promoters, sort of simple um, on-off switches like like uh, the the lactose op like like the lactose promoter and the arabinose promoter, um, and then more complicated uh, protein production systems, which can give you much much higher levels of protein production and and are and are basically on-off switches um, like like the T7 driven protein production. Um, we've looked at optimizing translation that includes things like rare codons, ribosomes, binding sites. Um, secondary structure of mRNAs and, th and, and the second codon and things like this. Um, and this time, we're going to, we're going to move, move on a little bit. Um, because part of producing the protein, it, it's fine. Essentially, central dogma brings you from DNA to a big polypeptide, but it doesn't actually give you, necessarily give you a functional protein. Um, so, there, so there might be further steps beyond actually making the, the polypeptide that that to, to get a functional protein. So, so the next bit, um, I was told by a friend um, at New England Biolabs that the next frontier in sort of um, in biotech in terms of helping people to, to make more protein is, is really protein folding. Um, and, it, and it's much more complicated. Um, good. So, so protein folding in, in, in encompasses sort of the very simple task of going from a polypeptide to a folded protein and that sort of biophysics. I want to sort of just cover the background for the biophysics because for me it always helps. To, if I understand in a theoretical sort of way how this stuff happens, I can, I can go back and try to troubleshoot it um, just by tweaking little things about the, the thing if I understand the principles. Um, and then we'll talk about post-translational modification and protein localization and how those can be important for, for getting functional protein. Um, Depending on where we are, we might break there. Because so this session today is split up into two sessions: one in the morning, one in the, the afternoon. And confusingly, they put it in two different lecture theaters. So, good luck. Uh, um, and uh, I, I don't know whether we'll make it all the way through all of the, the post-translational modifications and, and protein localization before we get to production. In, my, my goal is to make it through all of that before we get to protein production um, in eukaryotic microorganisms. Um, and again, we'll, we'll run through the same thing. We'll talk about useful species. We'll talk about standard expression, uh, expression vectors and inducible expression. Good. So this is what we talked about last time. And this time, we're going to talk about uh, problems with protein folding. And there are two main problems with protein folding. The, the first is that your protein can get degraded by proteases. That's when you when you know that you've got good production of your, of your polypeptide, you know that you're getting good transcription of it, you can see that it's being translated, but nonetheless, you still don't get any protein, right? And you prep your protein, and in, in the initial stages, you can see protein there when you, when you lyse your cells, but by the time you get purified protein, it's, it's fragmented into bits, and most of it's gone. Um, the other thing that can happen, which we'll probably actually talk about first, is, is that you can get protein aggregates in the forms of inclusion bodies and then just, uh, and, and other sorts of, of aggregated protein. And most of the time, protein aggregates aren't, aren't functional. They, they, they can be a useful tool for protein purification, but in terms of protein production, you usually want to avoid them. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about post-translational modifications. Good, so to come back to our troubleshooting issue here, again, what we have, um, is we have a protein that, that we're trying to produce. Uh, we, we take our whole cell lysate, we run it out, we see all the cells, uh, all of the proteins in, in the cell. Um, we, we add our IPTG or we heat shock or we do whatever it is that, or cold shock or whatever, or do whatever it is that induces production of our protein. Um, and we expect a big fat band here, but in fact what we see is a tiny little band. Um, so you have very low expression. And the question is, what went wrong? 
Um, another thing that can happen besides just getting actual sort of very low levels is, is what you'll do. Usually when, when you produce your proteins, you, you take your cells, you lyse them, um, and then you have this nice cell lysate, but the cell lysate is, is full of soluble things that are useful and, and then a whole bunch of insoluble crap that you want to get rid of, membranes, um, cell wall, unlysed cells, and, and, and any sort of cells, chromosomes, any sort of cell debris that you want to get rid of. So you'll do, you'll do this great big um, pelleting step at the beginning to get rid of all that insoluble crap. And what often ends up happening is, is despite having tons of protein here, you'll see that a lot of your protein comes down in this pellet. And that's a sure sign that your protein is, is aggregated. Um, and it, they're, so they're in, insoluble aggregates, or what we often call inclusion bodies. Um, now, if you talk to a microbiologist, there's some sort of difference between, like a microscopist, there's some sort of difference between, between inclusion bodies and aggregates. And, and I don't really want to get into that. I'm going to call them both the same thing. Essentially what they are, they're just great big clumps of insoluble protein. Um, in your cell, and you can see them in, in um, say, an electron microscopy. You can also see them just on phase contrast uh, microscopy. What you'll see is a little phase bright speck or phase dark speck in your cell, and that's all of your protein that's getting produced, and that's a sure sign that it's probably actually aggregating. Um, and the aggregated protein, like I say, is usually not functional. So you, I mean, most people say that you want to avoid this. I should add a caveat here that inclusion bodies are actually, they're, they're, they're dead useful if you can purify your protein this way. Um, so when, when you form an inclusion body, for, for reasons that are completely unknown, these inclusion bodies typically consist just of your, just of your protein of interest. They don't really have much else there. Um, and, and what's more, they... they they pellet, but they don't pellet at the same speeds as all the cell debris. So the, the cell debris will all pellet at sort of a low speed. Um, and if you give it a sort of medium speed uh, centrifugation, so sort of not, not quite ultra centrifugation, but somewhere, somewhere between sort of a low speed centrifugation and ultra centrifugation, these, these, this protein, which is uh, this, these aggregates, which consist almost entirely of your protein of interest, will pellet out and they'll be almost 100% pure. And if you're very lucky, you can take that protein and you can denature it. Um, usually we'll use things called chemical denaturants. I don't know if you've heard of urea or, or guanidinium. These are, these are chemical proteins that disrupt, um, that disrupt hydrogen bonds in the proteins and usually they'll break up these aggregates and make them soluble. Now that protein will be denatured and still won't be active, but often you can take it and if you dilute it out and dialyze away the, the guanidinium or the urea, um, in a sort of gentle way, the, the proteins will refold into their, into their active conformations. And if you can do that, you can get a lot of really pure protein. Um, there's some reasons why you may not want to purify your protein this way. You know, for, for one thing, many proteins just, you, this just won't work, right? If you try and purify your protein this way and try and renature it, probably the reason that it aggregated in the first place was that it was a little bit unstable. It just didn't fold very well and... That, that's why it formed the aggregates. Um, but the other thing is, is that renaturing your protein um, can be, you know, if you're doing this on an industrial scale, can be a bit inefficient. Right? You can get lots of really concentrated, really pure protein at one step, but then essentially you have to take that nice concentrated protein, and in order to get active protein, you have to dilute it out to really high levels. Um, and, and that creates large volumes, and large volumes aren't necessarily what you, what you want. What's more is it's a little labor-intensive, right, because it requires a couple of steps. It requires adding a denaturant. It requires diluting out the protein. It requires dialyzing away the denaturant. Um, and all of that can take time, which, which may not be on your side. Good. So to think about how, we, how you can sort of start to address this. Um, this is not stuff that would necessarily be in an exam, right? But it's all stuff that would help me think about, you know, th th this is all sort of future stuff. This is proper class, not, I'm, not I'm, I'm trying to give you a certificate here, right? Um, it always helps me to understand the, the principles behind something. Um, so so it's, it's good to remember, like, some basic principles behind protein folding. 
The, the first is that you know, proteins are essentially long linear polymers, but the long linear polymer in and of itself is not generally functional. Right? It has to fold, it has to go from being a long linear polymer, and it has to fold back on itself to form a three-dimensional structure, and it's that three-dimensional structure, or rather usually just a tiny portion of that three-dimensional structure. It's the actual functional bit that you're looking for. And there are two main forces that drive protein folding. We tend to think about protein folding in, in terms of enthalpic forces, right? The, the, this is stabilization of the, of the polypeptide chain um, w when it goes into a solution, right? To, to, to go from, they, they always say, going from order to, from disorder to order, there's some sort of sta stabilization. That's, that's your enthalpic force, right? Enthalpic forces include things like hydrogen bonding, um, and this is especially true for hydrogen bonds that form the back, with, with, with the backbone of the polypeptide, things that, like alpha helices, alpha helices and beta sheets. There are other hydrogen bonds that will hold the protein a bit more together to, to, to form a bit of the tertiary structure. These are things like um, van der Waals forces. So these are weak interactions where, where nature, a van der Waals force is basically just that nature abhors a vacuum, right? It doesn't like when there's no space in an, in an area. So... So two molecules that are close together will tend to cling to one another and stick to one another just to prevent a vacuum from being there. Um, and finally, you have electrostatic interactions, which are another form, sort of, depending on who you ask, are a form of weak um, intermolecular interactions, right? You have hydrogen bonds, which are, which are sort of, it's a weak interaction, but it's sort of starting to reach the, the strong interaction phases. But then you've got these weaker forces, like van der Waals forces and electrostatic interactions. So that's a positively charged amino acid with a negatively charged amino acid, right? Um, but the main driver for protein folding, which is the, the, the factor that we always seem to forget about, um, are actually entropic effects. Um, and, and this includes something called the hydrophobic effect. Now, usually when people talk about the hydrophobic effect, they talk, they, they talk about van der Waals forces and the fact that you know, proteins like to stick to one another, and hydrophobic amino acids just like to stick to one another. But it's actually, it's a bit more complicated than that. Um, but to, to get, but before we get to that, j just to remind you all, I don't know if, if any of you have done any biophysics, but, or basic biophysics, but when, when a protein folds, essentially you go, um, the, the first step in folding is something called the hydrophobic collapse. You, you, have, a, you have this long linear polymer, um, which is composed of hydrophobic residues, which are supposed to be these black residues, and hydrophilic residues, which are supposed to be these, these uh, white residues. And the hydrophilic ones tend to partition themselves to the outside of the molecule, and the hydrophobic ones tend to want to partition themselves to the inside of the molecule. Um, and like you say, it's... What drives this interaction is actually something rather, rather complicated and, and rather a bit more indirect than we usually feel comfortable talking about. Um, good, so don't pay attention to a lot of this. Essentially what we have are two different forms of entropy that are fighting against one another. You've got a linear polymer, and that linear polymer, just through forces of entropy, wants to occupy as many different conformations. It's like a string wants to sort of occupy as many different conformations as possible. Right? The other sort of entropy, though, that we don't really talk about is something called solvent entropy. Now, the solvent itself actually wants to, also wants to order, occupy the most disordered state possible. Right? And it's usually just because water wants to keep bleeding off um, all this heat. There's all this thermal motion in the water, and the water molecules tend to, tend to bounce around and, and want to move, right? Because another mo water molecule will come in and sort of displace it. Now, what happens if you throw a hydrophobic uh, molecule in the middle of water is that the water, um, be, because you know, we all understand that, that water forms hydrogen bonds, right? Um, what happens is, is the, the water wants to uh, satisfy all of its hydrogen bonds in order to fulfill all the, the enthalpy that it possibly can, but it also wants to move around as much as possible. And when you throw, when you throw a hydrophobic molecule in the, in the middle of a water solution, what ends up happening is, is the water needs to crystallize around, essentially needs to crystallize around that hydrophobic uh, 
little bit, right? Because the, the water can't satisfy a hydrogen bond by hydrogen bonding with this hydrophobic residue because it can't. Um, and that causes an ordering of the water around the hydrophobic residue. And, and the water doesn't, doesn't like that. So, so what's, what's much more energetically favorable is if you can bury that away. So for example, if this was a hydrophobic residue in the middle of a protein, this was a hydrophobic residue in the middle of a protein, right? The water is crystallized around this little black residue. And when the protein folds, now it's buried in the middle. The, the water can hydrogen bond with these hydrophilic residues, right? That's why they're hydrophilic. But, but then, it doesn't have to then it doesn't have to crystallize around these these black residues. And that's, that's really the gist of the hydrophobic collapse. And, and it's, it's the main driver of the hydrophobic effect. Oh, good, I had that in there. And it's really these electrostatic interactions that, that further stabilize. After the hydrophobic collapse, you have all these weak interactions and electrostatic interactions that stabilize the, the molecule structure and, and give the thing that it's, its three-dimensional shape. Right, so, so that's meant to say that what we have is we have this balance between the conformational entropy of the, of the, of the polypeptide chain um, and these two sort of forces that are holding the, the protein together, the, the hydrophobic effect and, the, and, the, and, and these enthalpic forces. And that means that, oh, hello, my screen's gone. Um, that means that folded proteins are really... The, People who work on protein folding, we, we talk about these big, um, the, these big free energies of folding, right? But they but they tend not to be very big free energies of folding. They're, they're actually on, on the big on the large scale of things. If we talk about reversible reactions, they're actually very they're actually very small changes in free energy. So proteins are really very much on the verge of stability. And what that means is that in, in a given solution, the pro, uh, I don't know if you remember, your, your, this is where it starts to get a bit more important, right? Um, if, you, if you remember your, your equilibrium chemistry, you'll know that as you get, as you get closer to the, to the TM or to the melting point, right? It, it, as, the, as the delta G becomes less and less and less negative, you approach a point where you have more and more and more unfolded proteins under equilibrium conditions in the cell. Right? So since these are not big changes in the, in the free energy of folding, what that means is that in solution, there's always a few molecules that are probably unfolded right? because the delta G of folding is not very large. Right? And as you approach conditions that, that, that say, you raise the temperature, um, or you add a little bit of denaturant, or you add a bit too much salt, as you approach, as, as you cause that delta G to become less negative, you increase the number of unfolded proteins in the cell. Um, this, is, right, this is the equation that dictates that, but don't, don't bother memorizing it. Right? You should all be familiar with this equation. You should be familiar with how you get from, th this is just standard equilibrium kinetics, so you should all be familiar with these equations already, but I'm not, I'm not going to ask any sort of questions about this. It's just to, to re-illustrate the point, right? If you have an unfolded protein and a folded protein, and they're in equilibrium, the, the, the free energy of folding is going to be, you know, you want it to be negative. So, so the equilibrium, the, and the delta G is dictated by the, by the equilibrium constant, right? So that's folded, concentration of folded over unfolded. So as this becomes closer, to, if this number were really negative, most of your protein would be in the folded state. As this number comes close to zero, more, more and more protein is in the unfolded state. At, at zero, about 50% is in the unfolded state. Right, that's, that's, that's all I mean to say about that. But just an interesting tidbit, too, on the side. I, I, I found several years ago that somebody presented a presentation that there are lots of proteins um, that, have t that, that have a two-state equilibrium. You have a protein that's most stable at a, at a particular temperature, right? Usually we think, okay, you cool it down. Temper temperature is the thing that dictates folding. So if you raise the temperature, the protein, you know, there's more heat energy, and that causes the protein to unfold because the, the polypeptide chain needs to breathe the, 
bleed off the thermal motion of the, of the solvent. Um, right? So you, th this is sort of the inverse of the, of the delta G, right? This is the delta delta G. So instead of being negative, we're positive. But as we, as we re increase the temperature, we reach a point, a TM, on the hot side of things. And, and on, on, on that side, the protein unfolds. We should all be familiar with that. But, but an interesting fact is that if you take your, your, very, your, your folded protein at the, at the, the best um, temperature, for folding, and you decrease the temperature, at some point you're actually decreasing the hydrophobic effect, right? Because at some point the water, if it gets cold enough, the, wa the, the water starts to freeze itself. And if there's enough thermal motion in the, in the water already so that the water is a liquid, the protein can unfold. It doesn't happen with a lot of proteins, but it's something to be aware of. <laughs> um, and, and to me, it really drove home the point of, of, of how, how these different conditions can actually affect protein folding. Right. Good, so what happens when we, as we get closer to, the, to, to, to these areas where we have a, to these regions, temperatures, or conditions where, where, the, where the free energy of folding starts to get closer to zero, or even, say, the best, the, the optimum temperature for folding is is, is, is actually still very close to zero. Um, well, what happens is, is you have more protein in the unfolded state. That, of course, that, right, your protein is now, it's an equilibrium between a folded and an unfolded form. Um, as you get close, as the, as the free energy of folding gets closer to zero, you have more protein in the unfolded form. And that folded form is, that unfolded form is then prone to degradation. So proteases can access this polypeptide chain and chop it into bits. Usually proteases won't digest a fully folded protein because the active site can't access the, the, the backbone of the polypeptide. Um, or the other thing is, is if this is concentrated enough, that protein will tend to aggregate. Uh, it'll, it'll tend to clump with itself. There, I think we'll talk about this. Um, one last thing about protein folding, and that's, that's to talk about, about folding kinetics. Um, usually we think about protein folding as a, as a simple linear pathway. You produce an unfolded protein. That unfolded protein um, either goes, folds, collapses, and, 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 and goes straight to a folded protein, or say collapses into a molten globule state, so some sort of intermediate um, with some secondary structure. And then, and then goes to a folded state. Um, and, and usually, we shouldn't worry about this form of the protein because this form of the protein d doesn't exist very much. What we're, what we're usually worried about is this intermediate here and the life of this intermediate. So the longer that intermediate is around, ah, screw energy diagrams, let's not talk about that this year. So, so actually, I mean, I present this as a, as a simple folding pathway, but, but, but there are lots of studies that suggest it's actually a bit more complicated. Proteins can go from an unfolded state through an intermediate state, or sometimes they can go straight to the, to the folded state. But again, what we're worried about are these, are these sort of stable intermediates in, in protein folding. So things, what I mean by stable is not necessarily that they, they, they stay around all the time, but, but the fact that they, that, that they live, that, that they're around for a long enough period that, that something can happen, right, complicated. Right, the, the, the problem is, is that if this, if this intermediate is around long enough, it's exposing sites on itself that, that are meant to, to interact with other bits of the protein, right, to form the folded structure, but some of those bits can interact with itself. And if that happens, you can get two proteins coming together, and that's called a nucleation reaction. Right? And once that nucleation happens, you can get more intermediates building on that, li that little nucleus, and that builds and builds and builds until you get a, an aggregate. Right? And, and critically, the, the rate of, of, at which this protein aggregates, aggregates is dependent on two things. One is, is how frequently you build a, an aggregate, or a, a, a nucleus, 
nucleus, th- th- that nucleus formation is, is really pretty random. Um, but the rate of nucleus formation and the rate at which you form, at which you extend on to that aggregate is dependent on the concentration of the intermediate. And the, inter- the concentration of the intermediate is, is dependent on the concentration of the fully folded form. Um, we could also talk about molecular chaperones. If there are molecular chaperone that were dependent for conversion of the intermediate form to the folded form, right? Are you all familiar with molecular chaperones? We'll talk about them in a little bit. Molecular chaperones are enzymes that help proteins fold. And there are some molecular chaperones that are required to convert sort of a stable intermediate to a, folded, a fully folded form. And that the, the, those, um, if you had, a, if you required a molecular chaperone to go from this state to this state, and you had too much of this and not enough molecular chaperone to sort of convert it into the folded state, you would also increase the amount of the intermediate. Right? So, so, so it depends on two things, the amount of unfolded protein and the rate at which you're converting this intermediate into the folded form. Right? And, and the more intermediate you have, the faster you build up aggregates. Right? So, so thinking about troubleshooting, that's, that's where we come back to the actual topic of the lecture. If, you, if you're using a T7 system to, pr- to, to produce your protein and you're making lots and lots of protein in the cytoplasm of E. coli, and E. coli has a chaperone that, that, that will do the job, um, but there's just not enough of it in the cell. Say, say take, there, there's, a, there's a chaperone in called GROEL. Um, gro- GROEL the, the, is required for the folding of some proteins in E. coli, but there's not a ton of it in the cell. Um, if there's not enough, if this protein requires GROEL, and, and GROEL is, is their hom- homologous molecules that you find in eukaryotes, and, and, and it's actually required for the folding of some eukaryotic proteins in E. coli. Um, so if there's not enough GROEL on the cell and you've got too much of this protein, it'll tend to aggregate rather than fold, right? The, the, the unfolded protein will tend to aggregate. So what you can do is you just make less of the protein, right? If there's less of the protein, there's less chance of two, mo- two unfolded molecules coming in contact with one another, right? Because they'll tend to fold rather than, s- rather than rather on their own, rather than stick to one another, right? So, so again, like I say, the key is that the aggregation depends on the concentration of the unfolded protein or the, the unfolded intermediate. So the solution is to lower the rate of protein production, at least, l- lower the rate at which you, you, you synthesize um, proteins, and just express the protein for a longer period of time. There are lots of ways to do this. At the beginning of my talk, we, we talked about different sort of expression vectors, right? You could use a, a lower copy number expression vector. Um, you could use a less strong promoter. Um, so, so, so instead of using a T7 promoter, use or a, or a um, I don't know, you're probably not familiar with a P trick promoter. They're optimized lactose promoters. You could use the sort of wild type lactose promoter, which which um, produces, which uh, expresses genes at a slightly lower level. Um, you could mod, but the way that most people sort of modulate gene expression, right, is, is usually they only find this out. Right? This tends to be trial and error, right? You, you can't look at a protein and know it's going to aggregate. And so by this point, you've already cloned your protein into a T7 promoter, um, it, and, and, and you're set up to synthesize tons of the protein, and now you've got this expression vector, and you have to lower the expression again. So a lot of people will do that by, by co-expressing this T7 lysozyme at different levels to sort of tamp down the, the rate of production of the protein. Um, you could also change, as we talked about in the last lecture, you could change the first few codons of the, of the, of the um, mRNA just to, just to sort of lower the, the rate of expression. Um, or you could use more slowly translated codons. In fact, uh, there's a couple of very interesting papers. We're running a little low on time because we started late. But there are a couple of interesting papers that you might want to look at. Um, so, so in this paper in particular, the, the authors, what they were trying to do is they were, they were looking at production of, of a luciferase in E. coli. It's a firefly luciferase, right? It doesn't come from E. coli. So the codons are not optimized for production in E. coli. Um, they're actually not even optimized for production in fireflies. 
right? Because you don't apparently need too much luciferase in the cell. And what they, what they found was that if you put, you could, you could optimize the codons for production in E. coli, and you would end up with lots more protein, but, so, so the, and the activity itself might be higher, but if you look at something called the specific activity, right, so that's the amount of activity you see per protein unit, you see the specific activity actually goes down, so each one, that there are fewer actual functional luciferase molecules. Um, and they, they theorized that was because luciferase is a protein that we also use for protein folding studies because it's very prone to, to denaturation and aggregation. Um, so so what, what the authors thought was, okay, what happens if we go back and we plug in different um, slow reading codons? In fact, they can recover some of the specific activity from that just, just by slowing the rate of translation. Um, so right, so there, so there are lots of different things that you can do. So you can use more slowly translated um, codons. You can also decrease the rate. That, so so there, there, there's one other thing that you can do, and this is this is not a this is not a, a wonderful answer for a te- for a for an exam, um, but 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 it, it is an answer. But the way in real life, you know, you can optimize all of this. This is all stuff that you would want to put on an exam. In, in real life, what we tend to do is we just tend to take, so I'm, you know, we're splitting this into what can we, what can we um, sort of examine you over and, and what do we actually do. So in real life, what we actually do most of the time is, is you just take the, the culture um, and, and you can just lower the expression temperature. That, that has lots of effects. Right? You produce the pro- you know, usually we think E. coli grows at 37, let's produce our protein at 37. Some people say, okay, let's produce it at 30. Um, but actually, I know a lot of people who, who no longer produce any of their proteins at sort of 37 or 30 degrees Celsius. They tend to just do an expression at, at 25 degrees overnight. That has several effects, right? One, it decreases the rate of translation. Um, translation, it, it seems, is just particularly prone to change, it's, it's particularly sensitive to changes in temperature. Um, the other thing it does is if you have a high copy number vector, it lowers the copy number. And again, for, for sort of unclear reasons, you go from having like 25 copies per cell to something like 10 to 12 copies per cell if you're using a, a standard cloning vector. Um, and then the other thing that it does uh, is, it, is it increases the stability of the protein by, by changing the physiology of the cell. So, so that brings up a topic of heat, right? Um, we keep talking about talking around heat and protein folding. Um, but there are multiple ways that heat can actually contribute to protein folding, both direct and indirect. You know, one is the standard sort of way. You increase the temperature, the protein unfolds because it just needs to move around through, through sort of entropic forces. Um, the other thing that happens, though, is you increase the rate of protein synthesis, right? If you lower the temperature and you decrease the rate of protein synthesis, if you raise the temperature, you'll probably increase it. But then finally, there's another indirect method by, by which it um, can decrease the stability of your protein, and that's, that's through something called the heat shock response. This is a complicated regulation pathway, but basically what the heat shock response is in E. coli is it senses unfolded proteins, Right? and heat causes proteins to unfold, that gets sensed through the molecular chaperones of the cell, and when the molecular chaperones get overwhelmed, what that does is it feeds back and turns on the production of, of proteases and chaperones. You know, chaperones are great right? because they'll help your protein fold, but what we're more worried about are those proteases. The, the, the goal of the protease is really to degrade proteins that are stuck, that can't be folded, aggregated proteins and things like this. Um, and it's a way of just sort of clearing the cell of all these unfolded proteins and sort of starting afresh. Um, so there, there are some solutions to this, right? One solution is to lower the expression temperature. Again, it's always lower the expression temperature. We already talked about that. But, another, but the other thing to do is to, instead of producing your protein in a standard E. coli strain, is to produce it in an E. coli mutant. That E. coli mutant can be defective for the, for the heat shock response, so, it's, so it could be defective for, for the sigma-32 protein, um, which is required for the heat shock response in coli. Uh, 
Um, or there are lots and lots of proteases in the cell, and you can start, the cells start to get a little bit sick, but you can start um, making mutations that get rid of many of these proteases. So for example, um, you could get rid of CLIP XP and, and, and AP in LON and FTSH. Really, we're usually not so worried about those proteases. Those are ATP-regulated proteases, and they tend to fall apart when, when you lyse the cells. What we're usually more worried about are these proteases that are produced in the periplasm and in the cell envelope. Um, they tend to be fairly strong proteases. Um, so you can produce your protein, and it'll be perfectly stable with, if you have it in the cell, but when you lyse the cell, what happens is um, you'll have all of these proteases that are, that are released into the, into the supernatant, um, and now things like OPT, which was previously in the outer membrane, now has access to your protein and can de degrade it. And things like the heat shock response in increase the production of OPT, right? So you could just decrease the heat shock response, of course, but, but the other option is just to get rid of OPT altogether. Cells don't need OPT, so you can just get rid of it. You can also use protease inhibitors, right? So all sorts of companies sell, sell all sorts of cocktails for protease inhibitors. You're probably familiar with, you might be familiar already with a protease inhibitor called PMSF. We've been using this protease inhibitor for years. It modifies the active site serine and many serine proteases, which is the major type of protease in the cells. But, but you, can, you can buy cocktails of lots of different protease inhibitors from companies like Roche. They sell all different kinds. Um, and it would be worth doing a little bit of research uh, into those protease cocktails or protease inhibitor cocktails before you actually produce your protein. So, for example, Roche sells at least two different kinds of protease inhibitor cocktails, one of which contains EDTA and one of which does not. So EDTA, are you all familiar with EDTA? So EDTA is a chelating agent. It, it, and, it, and it binds to most divalent metals. We usually talk about it in, term, in, in, conjugate, in combination with magnesium, but actually it'll, it'll, it'll um, chelate lots of, of transition metals a lot better. One of them is zinc, and there are lots of zinc-dependent proteases in the cell. But your protein of interest might require magnesium, might require iron 2, might require manganese or something in order to function. Um, and so you wouldn't want to use an EDTA-containing cocktail with that. You would want to use some other protease inhibitor cocktail. They've gotten surprisingly good. Um, the PM, it used to be we just used PMSF, and if you were lucky, you, you increased the stability of your protein, and most of the time you weren't lucky and your protein got degraded. But the, but the cocktails have gotten really very good recently. You could also use a buffered media. It's always important to buffer your media. Usually we grow our, our media in LB, which is unbuffered. Um, but things like very low pH or very high pH can also cause protein unfolding. And when you lyse your cells, oh, well, it, it, that, that change, that they, they might already have the, the heat shock response on from this high or low pH. Or it could be even that, that, that it affects the pH of the buffer that you lyse your, your, your cells in. So it might be a good idea just to buffer your media. One last thing that, that people have tried to do is they've tried... Well, this is just to highlight a general point. So sometimes what you're trying to do is you're trying to produce a eukaryotic protein um, in a bacteria. And sometimes it just doesn't work, right? We're talking about organisms which are billions of years diverged. A couple of billion. Um, and even though they have very similar uh, chaperone systems, at, at least when you look at them on the surface, when it comes down to functionality, they just don't work as well. First of all, eukaryotes have many more chaperone systems. They have, this, they have an HSP90 system. E. coli has an HSP90 system too, um, but it doesn't work the, the same way. Um, all, all creatures seem to have this HSP70 system, which is this DNA KJ in E. coli. All systems seem to have this GROEL protein, in e, which we, this protein, the chaperone that we call GROEL in, in E. coli. Um, that's trick CCT in eukaryotes, but again, trick CCT doesn't work the same. It, it do, doesn't work on the same proteins as GROEL does. So it might just be the chaperone system. But one thing that you could, you might be able to do, is to co-express chaperones. Right? You could. It's possible that you could co-express a chaperone from eukaryotes 
that would help your eukaryotic protein to fold, or people have found just that, just that co-expressing bacterial chaperones can help your protein to fold. Um, and there are strains that you can buy that will help you to do that. Finally, one, one sort of, again, a, a very cheap way of increasing the stability of your protein, and, and, and it's something that we really don't understand the basis for, um, is to fuse a soluble protein that folds well to one of the termini of your protein. Right, so what people have found is that if you fuse a protein like glutathione S-transferase or maltose binding protein, these are, these are typical tags that we fuse to proteins, what, what people have found is that you could have a semi-stable protein and just the presence of the maltose binding protein or the thyroidoxin 1 or whatever else increases, causes your protein to fold better. The, the, the physics are just completely not understood, but, but that's what happens. Um, so, so, so I put up a reference here to show you an example of fusing a protein, I think, to maltose binding protein, although I can't quite remember anymore. It's quite an old reference. Um, but one of the proteins that we've used in my lab is a is a protein called SUMO. That's a small ubiquitin-like modifier from yeast. SUMO has two, has, has two benefits. One, it, it, it's a rock. Right? Proteins that fold really well we call rocks because they don't tend to unfold with heat. Um, but SUMO is a rock. And it has, it has another um, benefit in that, in that SUMO itself can serve as a site-specific protease. So you can use it as a tag for purification. If you fuse it to the end terminus of your protein, there are all these desumolases, which are really just proteases that recognize the sumo and chop the peptide bond with the C terminus of the sumo, leaving, leaving your protein alone. Um, and this can often stabilize your protein. Right, so this is a this is a picture of what that might look like. Yes. Sometimes, yeah. That, that can be an issue. And if your protein is functional with the tag and the tag doesn't interfere with whatever you need to use it for, then maybe you should just leave the tag there. Often you need to get rid of the tag. So if you're producing lots of protein for, say, x-ray crystallography, you need, you need lots of really pure protein. And you may think that the, the tag interferes with the conformation of your protein. You might want to get rid of the tag. So, so you know, it's often worth trying a small batch. Once you have your pure protein, trying a trying a small batch and cleaving, the, cleaving the, the tag from the end terminus of the protein, seeing if your protein aggregates. And if it doesn't, hey, fantastic, right? You've got pure protein. I, I don't, again, people don't quite understand why these tags work. They help the protein fold, but they don't seem to increase the stability of the final folded protein. So once it's folded, it seems to stay, stay stably folded, folded if you chop off the tag off and even, even unfold, even unstable proteins will stay folded. Um, but yeah, at, at this point, you know, once we've gone beyond, once we've gone beyond translation, we're sort of entering the area of, hey, let, let's try it out. We, we've got sort of a theoretical framework to start, to start tinkering around with this to see if we can improve protein production. Um, but we don't really understand what's going on, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of trial and error. Good. We're at molecular chaperones, um, but we've only got 10 minutes left. I usually end the second lecture early, um, so, so I'm going to suggest that we stop here and we pick up again um, in the afternoon with, 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 uh, with chaperones um, and, and protein localization, post-translational modifications, and then finally protein production in, in yeast, which really isn't too different from protein production in coli. Good. About protein folding and, and problems that you can have with protein folding. Right? And, and, and most of these problems are intrinsic to the folding of the protein itself. Right? We, we, talked a, we talked a bit about heat and sort of protein folding. We talked about concentration of unfolded intermediates and the problems of protein aggregation. Um, and, then, and then finally we talked about molecular chaperones. This, this is a bit external to the protein, but, but still really has to do
we haven't sort of moved beyond the cytoplasm. We haven't done anything complicated yet except for penetrating the cytoid cells from the um, folding. But there's another thing that can influence how your protein folds and whether it folds correctly or not, and that, that's the localization of the protein, right? All of the processes that we've been talking about so far in the bacterium are, are in this compartment right here, the cytoplasm compartment, right? That's where all of the DNA is, that's where the amino polymerases are, it's where all the nucleotides are, it's where all the amino, well, there's no amino acids out here, but a fair amount of nucleic acids and things like all of the ribosomes are here and the proteins and proteins are here in the cytoplasm. Um, but th there are a lot of proteins that for various reasons that, that really don't fold very well in, in the cytoplasm. That sounds a little bit strange because the cytoplasm is supposed to be nice if it folds, right? It's supposed to have all these chaperones um, as opposed to the, the periplasm or the extracellular milieu which are full of, of, of proteases and things to get rid of the protein, of any sort of protein excess. But there is this sort of rule, and it's a general rule, right? It's, it's one of these rules of thumb. Um, I shouldn't say it like that, but, but we have this rule of thumb, right? That, that means that, that it means that it, it's just sort of a, a thing, it's something that people say, and it's only most of the time that it's not true. Um, anyway, so there's this general rule that you're supposed to produce the protein uh, where it's normally expressed in the cell. Now, obviously, if you're making a, a eukaryotic protein, the eukaryotic protein is never going to be in the periplasm, but the closest, in, in some ways, the closest compartment to, say, the U, to, to the ER lumen or a, or a lysosome or um, one of these other compartments it is the periplasm. Um, and the way that proteins get into the into the periplasm or the extracellular milieu, there's this big step in this process that's carried out by machinery called effect machinery. It's machinery that I know very well, but I won't go into detail um, about it today. But basically, uh, for most proteins, at least most soluble proteins, what'll happen is the whole protein is synthesized. These proteins typically have a targeting signal um, somewhere in their, in their primary structure that, that, that usually takes the form of an N-terminal signal sequence. That N-terminal signal sequence allows it to get recognized by the translocation machinery um, and translocated across the membrane and through the scanner, which is formed by these proteins called YAG, um, with the help of ATP or the spec A. Um, it can also have the help of a chaperone called spec B. Um, and what spec B does is it keeps proteins in place. So, um, I mentioned that this channel, there, there are a couple uh, salient features about this one is that this channel requires the protein to be unfolded in order to pass through it. The whole thing is only large enough to, to, so that it'll fit between B and D. And it'll only fit in, between any of these proteins. Um, there's some other things that come in. You can, you can get something slightly larger, but even still, it's not going to fit a, a hole through the protein in the channel. That's, that's one aspect of it. And what, what step B does, which is just a molecular chaperone, is it keeps the protein from folding so that it can be translocated. And that brings up the second salient feature of this translocation technique. And that's that in bacteria, it is unlike in growing plant cells and mice cells. Um, in bacteria, most soluble proteins, and I'll point out a number of proteins that are soluble in bacteria, are, are usually fully or, or mostly fully synthesized before they can be translocated across the membrane. Now, if you make a fully folded protein, that means that that has a chance to fold. But if the protein folds, it won't go out through this channel that I've already described. Um, good. So, so if you put all things to bear in mind, usually there's no problem, or often there's no problem with fully folded proteins. Um, right? What you can do if you want to produce your protein in the periplasm is you can just artificially feed the EKI signal sequence to your protein of interest, and usually it'll get recognized, or at least a fraction of it will get transported across the membrane to the protein, M maybe even most of it. Um, I don't know how true this is, but, but 
worth noting that the signal sequences are very similar across evolution. They all look roughly the same. Plot is, is best to take a signal sequence from, if, if, it's, if you're going to express a eukaryotic protein in E. coli, you want to put it in the karyophyte. Um, it's best to use E. coli signal sequence to replace the native signal sequence with an E. coli signal sequence. There are some differences. Um, so for example, E. coli signal sequences tend to be a little bit more hydrophobic. The full differences aren't entirely known. You can spot the differences using the neural network survey, but you don't really know. Um, anyway, so, so in fact, th this is a way of producing proteins that people have made for years, and there are lots of there are lots of signal sequences that can be put into um, patient vectors. So, for example, the signal sequence for protein called Cal B. Why people picked out Cal B, I don't know. It's not even found in K12. It just happened to be a signal sequence that people thought worked really well in expression. Um, so actually it does empirically make sense to have these signal sequences in frame um, with the translate to the start site and then to disseminate to your protein to send the Cal B signal sequence and then send that to your protein to use the signal sequence. Um, some other ones that you can use from the, um, the, the native um, E. coli K12 are the signal sequence from alpha spike E protein and other things that people have used are signal sequence from alpha and FOS cocaine. Like I say, the, the, one of the issues with this pathway is that if you make it very good at protein transfer, it's not so good protein transfer at either FOS or MIMCO. So if you have a protein that folds reasonably rapidly, you'll end up having a, a, a small fraction of it or even a large fraction of it is stuck in the cytosol. Um, and that, that, that sort of getting trapped is, is basically what goes on. One way that, that people have found around this, that this is the same way you don't use as much for protein as possible, but um, it is used in, in biotechnology in some sense to produce proteins for other purposes, um, is to fuse a different sort of signal sequence where you can fuse it. So uh, most signal sequences will try to be good for standardization by the signal sequence that you've already But there is a small um, subset of signal sequences that was recognized very early in translation in the theory called the signal recognition particle. And this is analogous to the signal recognition particle in, in these studies. And what it'll do is it'll recognize that signal sequence, take the entire translate and write it in, and couple it to a channel. So essentially you're synthesizing the protein directly in the protein that you've copied. So if your protein folds really rapidly and you really want to put it in the karyotype, then your best bet is to take a signal sequence from a protein like the DHEA and then try to use that sequence as your dependent protein. Okay. Um, you know, so, so, so what the so this is this has been useful, for example, in, in stage control. So what these authors have done in their paper um, was they were trying to express a protein called a scarfin. And are you all familiar with stage display? So stage display is, is, is a method for selecting um, key proteins, for, for, for sort of rendering mutagenizing one protein and selecting it to, to interact with, with another protein. Um, you should look into the method. It's, it's, it's totally ineffective. Um, but, but basically, what, what it requires you to do is to take your DARPIN and speed it up by the sec factor. Problem, um, and you can do this with any protein. It doesn't matter if it's a DARPIN or, or a monoclonal antibody or, or an inhibitor or, or any other such thing. Um, but in this case, they were interested in a class of proteins called scarfins because scarfins are proteins that act as proteins in some sense. So they, they have this. Um, so the problem with scarfins is that they fold too rapidly. And what the, what the authors found is that they, they just couldn't get very good at the express the production of the stage for any kind of a stage display. What they found is that if they sent a DHEA signal sequence or other signal sequences to the target protein to see what it looked like in the pathway, they suddenly found that their proteins were really, were exploited really well for the karyphyte when they got the speed to do, do in, in stage play. And, and this is a little counterintuitive because this, this signal sequence often doesn't turn out very good at synthesis of the protein in the cytosol. 
That's what sort of led to the conclusion that we came to. Good. Another reason why you might want to put a protein because the question is why do you want to put a protein in the periplasm in the first place? Well, one reason is just because in phase two play, obviously, there's some matter that requires you to put this protein in the periplasm. Um, but another reason why you might want to put a protein in the periplasm is that lots of proteins contain dicarboxylic. Antibodies that, that are made to provide biological messages. And these, these proteins all contain one or, or several uh, dicarbide binding agents. Now, uh, maybe, maybe the literature has changed in the meantime, but when I was a student, we all knew dicarbide binding was done simultaneously, which is actually wrong. Um, there's actually dedicated machinery in, in the periplasm called the DSP machinery, which I put up here. Yeah, it's called the DSP machinery that's involved in making dicarbide binding. Um, so if you put your protein out into the periplasm, this machinery, that is protein DSPA, will transfer dicarbide binding to the substrate for its uh, final use, dicarbide binding group. I should mention also, you probably, probably people, you might have heard that the periplasm is oxidized now, or that the ER lumen is oxidized, and that and the cytoplasm is reducing. There's actually dedicated machinery in the cytoplasm that is dedicated to keeping dicarbide binding dormant. So any dicarbide binding that accidentally formed in the cytoplasm would have to be reduced. And that's the thyroid optimal duty that we're talking about. All right. Another reason why you might want to put your, your, your protein in this periplasm is there's also sufficient matter. But if this, if this dicarbide bond is, is the wrong dicarbide bond and it doesn't allow it to occur, there's this, there's this dicarbide binding isomerase called DSPP, and it will take your protein, reduce it, and then allow, give it another go at, at protein building. useful when we start thinking about protein folding. Um, mostly just because it's worth knowing uh, that this machinery exists because what, what, what it suggests is that it depends on how you export the protein to other regions. So there's two different pathways for exporting protein to the periplasm. One is this hyperbole regurgitation, which can be done by protein folding. Depending on the pathway for the uh, for, for the protein to get, you'll get different methods of dicarbide bond formation. Um, most proteins in E. coli, the, the E. coli is really set up to form dicarbide bonds in, in the methods of protein folding. So, so, so what I mean by that is you, you might have four cysteines in a protein, and I would suggest that the one that you do is the true E. coli. Um, and, and in E. coli, E. coli preferentially forms dicarbide bonds in one of the regions of the protein. Um, but there are a lot of proteins, like a protein, that form dicarbide bonds between cysteine 1 and cysteine 8, or cysteine 3 and cysteine 4 or 5 or whatever, or between cysteine 1 and cysteine 6. But the, but the dicarbide bond machinery in E. coli will preferentially form cysteine 1 and 2. So you need this, this, this machinery to break that dicarbide bond to give it another go at protein. I am very loath to rule anything out, um, but categorically. But as a general rule, yes, that's the case. There, there really aren't any dicarbide bonds in, in, in native, in, in native um, cytoplasmic proteins. I think, um, and I don't remember my enzyme mechanism well enough to remember, but, there, but, but I think maybe ribonucleotide reduction forms a dicarbide bond as part of this catalytic cycle. And, and, and I think you need thyroid optimal to reduce that. At least I, I know 
reason the reductive system, if, if you knock out all the reductive systems and you, and you, and you pull out thyrodoxin, thyrodoxin 1, thyrodoxin 2, or even just thyrodoxin vectors and glutaridoxin for that case, um, that, that kills all the, the reductive pathways. The cytoplasm itself dies. The reason that they die is because ribonucleotide right, reduction is too much. The, 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 you can't make the ribonucleotide right, reductase can't NTP to the DNTP. Um, and if you can't make DNTPs, you're dead, right? <laughs> um, so as far as I know, there are no proteins that form by subdivision normally in the cytoplasm. We'll, we'll come back to that in just a second. Good. So, so depending on the pathway to export proteins by, that can also affect whether you get stuck by sulfitoxin from one to a new pathway, right? Whether you get this preference for, for disulfitons for being consecutive to sulfitons or not. So if you export proteins by the co-translational pathway, you'll, you'll prefer to get disulfitons if you're one to a new pathway. If you export proteins by the co-translational pathway, you're supposed to, to prefer to get, you're supposed to allow the protein to export and then get, go through a, a, a preliminary folding step, which might allow your proteins to fold a bit more natively before you get disulfiton formation. It's all a bit of hand waving, right? But what it tells you is that you might want to try more than one if, if you're really having problems producing your protein at the peri plus, and you really need to put it to the peri plus to, to produce it, you might want to try different types of pathways and get it out there because it could affect the folding of the protein. Um, another reason why you might want to put the protein in the peri plus, and just, just as an aside, is, is that recently. Uh, a group here has come up with a way of producing proteins directly into the media, right? Now, now we've been talking about protein folding in the peri plus, um, but there might be, a, but, but what this group has done is they've produced a way of, of they've come up with a way of producing the protein in such a way to get your protein cleaner in the next step. And basically it relies on this secretion system that, that inserts proteins into the outer membrane. Um, and when the protein gets inserted, basically what you have is you have a, a beta barrel that brings it through the outer membrane. And you have a passenger portion, and that, that, that's your protein of interest. Right? You have signal, a, a signal sequence that targets the protein for transportation across the membrane. And this system, what happens is that this beta uh, this, this outer membrane gets inserted into the outer membrane drags your passenger protein along with it. And once it's out into the periplasm, there's a cellulitic <coughs> event that feeds between the passenger and its, its outer membrane protein and releases the protein into the media. And now all you have to do is spin that in cells and it's completely done. Um, and everything that we've talked about so far also comes down, uh, also applies to this, right? If you have a protein that folds rapidly, may never get out across the cytoplasm, so it may never get out across through the second cleavage and across the membrane to any of the protein cells in the peri plus. There's some problems with producing this. If you, if you come back to this, to this, to this point from earlier, there, there are some problems with producing this protein in the peri plus. And they're, they're actually well-known problems because people have been trying to do this for years now. Um, you have all these complications that we've been talking about with the, the protein folding, the protein transportation, and, and maybe the, the, the way that the protein is exported might affect the way the protein folds. And once it's out there, you have another protein folding step, that especially if you're making a eukaryotic protein, uh, even if it's produced in, in the ER lumen, the ER lumen can independent chaperone. The periplasm as a whole has no end ATP, so there are no ATP dependent chaperones. Um, and that includes things like ATP70. The ATP70 is a major problem with this. There's no ATP70 in the periplasm as a whole. If your protein requires an ATP70 to fold, it won't fold, it won't fold in the periplasm as a whole. The, the other thing, as, as we sort of alluded to this earlier, is, is that there are lots of periplasms, or there are lots of proteases in the periplasm that can fold. 
Um, so if you put your it's well more pretty, probably more pretty than the fine ones of Jan Lehman. So if you put your tracing down into the into the fairy plot then, um, it might just disappear. So people, because of this, people have described the fairy plots in this very harsh environment for fruits and poisons. But there is an alternative to this, um, and that's that you can produce these tracing in cytosols. And, and, and the trick to this is to overcome this reducing environment for these cytosols. So we're just talking about this path a little bit ago. Two different pathways for reducing disulfide bonds in the cytoplasm. There's one that's called the deuterodoxin pathway, which is mostly offered as glutathione, which is a small molecule um, that, that, that contains a tracing system. That glutathione can reduce tracing directly, or it can reduce it to pass the tracing that's called deuterodoxin. And deuterodoxin can then reduce tracing basis. Um, but the most the most important one is tracing carbonucleoside reductase. Without reduction of carbonucleoside reductase, cells don't grow. Um, the, other, the other pathway is the thyroidoxin pathway, um, which, where there's a class of tracing called thyroidoxin that can be used as well. In both pathways, you need a way of you need a way of re-reducing your your glutathione, deuterodoxin, and thyroidoxin. In the glutathione pathway. There's a tracing that's called glutathione reductase, which reduces glutathione and oxidizes glutathione and thus reduces glutathione. In the thyroidoxin pathway, there's a tracing called thyroidoxin reductase, which is reduced by, um, which reduces thyroidoxin. And both pathways are called, are dependent on NADPH. Um, now, like I say, if you knock out both of these pathways, you don't get re reduction of carbonucleoside reductase, and now all you have to do is make the tracing system. No good. But what you can do, it, it turns out um, that somebody found a long time ago that if you, if you knock out one of these pathways, in particular, this, this, this thyroidoxin, if you knock out this tracing thyroidoxin reduction, what'll happen is the thyroidoxin, this thyroidoxin one in particular, will get oxidized eventually by thyronucleic um, carbonucleoside reductase, right? So carbonucleoside reductase gets oxidized. Thyronoxin reductase picks up the disulfide bond that forms that um, carbonucleoside reductase, and then the process is done. Um, and th now you've got an oxidized thyronoxin in, in the cytoplasm. And what thyronoxin does, strangely enough, if you're overproducing your tracing, is it'll, it'll pass that disulfide bond off onto a tracing basis. So you can you can do this. I mean, the way they first found this was they were producing an alkaline phosphatase. An alkaline phosphatase is normally used for plasma tracing, um, and it requires two disulfide bonds in, in order for it to be functional. And what they what they did was they took the signal sequence of this. So the tracing is cytoplasm, right? And what they found is that if you knock out thyroidoxin reductase, you now get thyroid, you now get some alkaline phosphatase activity. Actually, pretty good alkaline phosphatase activity. All of which is um, um, is that has several advantages, right? If if you if you now producing your tracing in an oxidized cytoplasm, you now have ATP dependent chaperones for that. Things like DNAK, which is just a derivative of Stemd, that are chaperoning these OELs. Um, you've also got lots of glutathione around, right? So the so the ER lumen also has lots of glutathione in it that can sort of help buffer disulfide bonds and serve and serve this exchange function. Um, and like I say, both of these are quite amenable as, as detail. Um, what the group that, that sort of started doing this work found was was that they could then what they then did was they knocked out glutathione reduction. Um, now, when you knock out both of these pathways, the cells don't shed, but for some reason they pick up a suppressor reactive trait. Um, you don't need to know about the suppressor, but the suppressor just allows you to live. But when you knock out both of these pathways, you have a, 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 a storage reactive trait that allows you to live. This process becomes even more efficient. And there, there are companies that, that sell derivatives of this. Um, one of the, the, the the one that, that most people would be familiar with is one called Origami. It's been around for 
another one is called shuffle. And it's basically origami, but it's but it's but what but what me and one biolab have done is we've put in a plasmid that contains a disulfide bond isomerase to sort of help help the disulfide bond formation. Um, and using this, people have used these two sort of methods in this case to create complicated um, disulfide bonding. Um, it's probably, it, it's still really difficult to produce, to produce a, a full antibody in the lab, right? Um, it's not what people have done is they've taken a variable there or just, just the, 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 the variable fragment, the variable um, domain of, of, of the antibody um, and have been able to, to produce those in the cytoplasm. I, and, and that works a little bit better than putting it in the cytoplasm of the tumor. Good. So that's where I sort of want to end this quick introduction back to we can keep going down the rabbit hole, right? <laughs> we we started to get more and more and more fiddly as we've gone on, right? And, and, and th th there are companies that sell all sorts of little fiddly things to just improve your protein um, production methods just a little bit more so you can get more and more and more um, and, and better and better and better purified protein. Uh, but at some point, you, you're just going to say, okay, I've had enough. I, it's time to stop fiddling around. Maybe we, we're producing eukaryotic protein. Maybe we should take that eukaryotic protein and produce it um, in a eukaryote. Now, you, you'll cover eukaryotic protein expression in, in, in like cell culture in another lecture. Um, but there are microbes that people frequently use for production of, of, of protein. Um, so microbial uh, eukaryotes that people use. Now, before we go into that, I just want to reprise again so everything that applies to protein production in bacteria also applies to pr protein production in eukaryotic microorganisms, right? So you want to pick an expression vector. And again, we have to remember that, that the most important thing is that you want the highest level of expression possible, right? Because your goal is to produce as much functional protein in as short a period of time as possible. Um, I expression may lead to toxicity, it may lead to proteoporin aggregation, or it may induce the heat shock response, all of which exist in eukaryotes too. So you have all of these, these choices that you have to pick. You have things like clean doses. You have clean, clean regulation. You've got suppressors and activators. You've got your own oxidation mechanisms. And you have inhibition of, of, of production using this T7 lysozyme, so you have ways of fiddling with protein production. Um, or you can change the mechanism of induction. Good. So why might you want to use a eukaryote? I'm not going to go into We've covered some of this stuff. Why might you want to use eukaryotes and microbes to fight well, one reason is just our road to high cell density is to fight what the bacteria will. You can get them in nice cultured flasks under sort of anaerobic conditions where you're both just substrate, right? Um, so these things work well. And they, have, they usually have relatively simple growth requirements. They're always a little bit more complex than bacteria are, just generally. Often they're, they're a little bit odd to cook or to require some supplementation of the media. But still, it's, it's usually a pretty simple media that you're growing them in. Um, you can grow them in huge batches and fermenters. They're rel they have relatively rapid growth rates, so again, not quite as fast as E. coli, but, but a lot faster than E. cell culture. Um, and some of these tools, some of these, um, these eukaryotic microorganisms have really well-developed genetics. Um, in, in particular, the benzene genetics, well, I have some, but, but we have been limited in genetics on this eukaryotic microorganism here, it's actually been quite a failed issue over the for years and years. So, so it's got a really well-developed um, genetic system. And that genetic system, what we've learned from, from studying Saccharomyces, is we've learned how to carry those genetics over to other eukaryotic microbes. Um, and the one that we'll, we'll be most interested in is this one, is, is 
I'm curious, curious on examples of cartoons that, that, that might be useful, that, that might be useful to produce as a neutral, things that have really complex folding pathways that require eukaryotic chaperones, things that require the special environment that the eukaryotic ER or, or the eukaryotic um, cytoplasm, um, and things with, with more complex cell cell pipelines than can be handled by the, by the, by the E. coli machine. Um, they're also, they're, bacteria tend to be a lot simpler in terms of, of, of what sorts of protein breaks on modification they can make. The, the E. coli really makes one kind of protein break on modification. Um, it makes a few different kinds of protein breaks on modification. We say cell site bonds. We haven't talked about acetylation or phosphorylation, but even where it makes some of these, these but it doesn't make um, N-linked glycosylation the same way it's applied to O-linked glycosylation or N-linked glycoproteins. Um, and even where it does make modifications that, that are made in eukaryotes, they're, also, they're not made with the same machinery, and so the same residues aren't phosphorylated or acetylated um, or methylated. Right? So, so, so rather than take all of that machinery from eukaryotes and put it in E. coli, it might just be easier to take your protein and put it in a eukaryote. It's also worth considering what, when you might just skip moving on to, to a eukaryote. For example, if you're producing mammalian protein, there are lots of there are lots of protein breaks on mod and, and the reason that you're producing the protein in, in a yeast is because it needs a, a, a certain type of protein breaks on modification. So for example, a glycosylation. Um, that glycos that, that sort of modification would happen in a eukaryote, and maybe a totally different type of, of protein breaks on modification. So, so for example, glycosylation. Of protein, you, you'll, you'll tend to get glycosylation of the same residues in, in lots of different um, eukaryotes, in eukaryotic microbes as, as you do in, in, in mammalian cells. But the type of glycosylation that happens is much different. That, so if you if you want to make a drug that you're going to inject into humans, you'll have a different glycosylation pattern, and that will get picked up by the immune gene. Um, and, and drug, which could render your drug inactive or cause an immune shock or some sort of immune consequence. Um, and there are a very few proteins that really require specialized uh, metazoan or mammalian chaperone in order to be produced. And of course, if you're making a bacterial protein, there's really no reason to produce the protein in, in a proteomic yeast. So again, just to, to say the things that we need to consider, we need to consider everything that we need to consider in, in E. coli. Um, basically, like I said, all of this stuff is still in optimization, and optimization and translation carries over. There's uh, almost one to one for tissue exercise in E. coli, so we won't cover that. Um, culture conditions, we, we don't need to talk about optimizing culture conditions. You can look these up online, and, and it's a little bit of voodoo anyway, right? You find the right culture and you, you can produce good protein. Um, and Things that can affect protein folding we won't cover either just because, again, it starts to get very fiddly. But what we will talk about is sort of what, what sorts of vectors are available, um, the sorts of promoters that you have, your choice of strain, um, and then finally the, how you might put your protein into the most appropriate compartment. Great. And for the most part, we're going to be talking about this organism, which is one. You could produce your protein. In fact, there might be samples here. For certain reasons that you might not want to produce your protein in a vacuum like yeast, um, one of those reasons is that vacuum like yeast is very difficult to wind through the tissue and therefore you could lose your yeast. Um, for people that prefer to do your genetic um, saccharomyces, you, you prefer to do the protein production in tissue and not soil. Um, there are really two sorts of plasmids. There, there are two sorts of, of uh, expression vectors in, in tissue. One of those is plasmids, so yeast have plasmids. Humans don't really have plasmids, but yeast do have plasmids. And plasmids tend to be relatively high copy number. They're not high copy number like E. coli high copy number, but they but they, you do have like say up to 10 copies of this gene per cell. Um, usually one of the nice things about using a plasmid is that these plasmids have or bacterial origins of replication. In fact, these have two origins of replication, what we recognize by the yeast. Um, replication machinery. Um, 
but they do have a, a bacteria origin replication, so you can see growing in bacteria, and then they have a separate origin of replication for growing in in vitro DNA, and that just makes it easy to manipulate manipulate their DNA in bacteria and then just put them in in vitro. Um, the one issue with this um, with using plasmids is that they use uh, unlike in bacteria, so bacterial plasmids are are usually they're a little bit unstable, but they're usually pretty stable. You, you, you should select for them all the time, right? Bacterial plasmids always have some sort of antibiotic marker so that you make sure that your bacterial DNA is not on antibiotics. But if you don't, most of your plasmids are going to have plasmid. That's not really true with yeast. Y yeast kick out plasmids pretty, pretty quickly. Um, so what people have done instead is, is what one benefit to using yeast as opposed to E. coli is that it's, it's really easy transform your yeast with a linear sequence DNA um, and to recombine that bit of DNA into the chromosome using homologous-free combination. Are you all familiar with homologous-free combination? You should be, right? So if you, if you have a bit of DNA sequence in, in say, your PCR product, it matches the DNA sequence in, in the host chromosome with the homologous-free combination between the two. Um, and, and if you can achieve homologous-free combination, you can replace that bit of DNA. Chromosomal integration is usually very straightforward. One of the really neat things, too, at least in thinking about it, is that you can get arrays of this. You can, it won't be, it won't be terribly stable, but what you can do is that if you think that the physics of this, so say part of this is your DNA sequence, you can also put in a gene that says the BMI is going to be stable. BMI is going to exist when has something called a gene dose dependence, right? So if you have one copy of a, of a gene, if your BMI is going to exist when it's gene, you, you have one level of resistance. If you double the number of BMIs that exist in that gene, you increase the resistance. And if you add more and more and more BMI of this, what you can do is you can amplify it with going an array, right? And by, by amplifying the BMI of the number of things, you're also going to reduce your amplifier if you're the the, the number of genes that encode this bit is infinite, and this can lead to a much higher production level of this. Um, now, th this is really just a side point. I'm sure that most of you know this already, but, but we need to think when we, when we start picking our, our dispersion vectors, we also have to consider what promoter we need to use. And I, I know that most of you should know this already, but bacterial transcription promoters will not work in, ca in particular cow storage. You have to pick a different promoter. Um, and for, for PCR, there tends to be three choices. There, there's one that's, that's the alcohol um, dehydrogenase anion promoter, which is involved, which normally promotes the synthesis of a methanol dehydrogenase that, that quickly loses its rubber. Um, there's another one for formaldehyde phosphatase, with gap cheese. But that's a that has a different level of production depending on the um, the carbon source that you use, right? So if you're growing in a yeast host, you get really good expression. You could grow the protein on the lactose and get a slightly different expression level, or you could grow it on glycerol and get a, a totally different level. And you knew which carbon source you wanted to use, then you could vary the expression of your protein depending on how much, or depending on which carbon source you're using. Or finally, there's one called glycine E1, which is a synergy inhibitor. There are some other ones, and you can look into them, and the benefits that we'll, that we'll start looking at at the end will, will be a lot more useful to you. Um, your choice of strain frequently, again, this, this will depend like in E. coli, it depends on the industrial setting. Um, PCR has it, the, the most common way of inducing protein expression, particularly if you use something like AMS promoters. Um, they're, they're normally quickly grows on methane. Um, and if you were to take a wild-type PCR cow storage experiment and try and induce expression on your protein using E. 
also want to create a new perspective about how the hydrogen and the phosphorus could be used to grow on that planet. That would lead to sort of, a, a, because we'd be using up the methanol, that then that would lead to, to downward growth of the otherwise contaminated own properties of the soil, um, which would lead to, you wouldn't necessarily get greater perspective. So, so in a yeast plus strain, it's very useful because you can, you can add methanol as the carbon source, and the strain would grow on that, and the methanol would also induce the production of the greater yield of NSHA. The problem with doing that is that the, the amounts of methanol that you would need to induce the production of NSHA is so huge that you'd have to get rid of all of it. Like we're talking about 20%, 30% methanol that you just dump into the ground and it's, it's just great. Um, so what people have done is they've, they've mutated these two AOP, two alcohol dehydrogenase strains um, with a yeast S strain that is just used to produce the two AOP strains. Um, one is, and in that one, that one has, that can be induced at slightly lower levels of methanol it's sensitive to low levels of methanol. So if you add, if you add too much methanol, um, the strain suddenly dies. Um, so, so, so instead of like dumping in methanol and allowing the bacteria to grow on the methanol, you usually have to supplement it with other carbon sources. Um, but you still get good production. And so you can refine these two drugs and have decided that has made a strain that is that is taking up more than one half of alcohol dehydrogenase per unit of mass of soil. And that leads to, to tighter control of but the upside is it can allow you some shelf life as well. For the same reason that you're sensitive to methanol, you should add these guys because the first step is an alcohol dehydrogenase and then methanol and the and the formaldehyde and that, that sort of thing should work. Good. So now you've picked out your expression vectors. You can pick out your inducible expression. And now, now the, the goal is to, is to pick out the most appropriate compartment. And again, the general rule is to reach the protein where it's normally expressed. So if you pick secreted proteins, ER proteins go to the ER lumen. Cytoplasmic proteins go, go to the cytoplasm. With yeast, you have all the, you're producing a eukaryotic protein. You have all these options, right? You can put a Golgi protein in. Golgi, you could, you could pick it as it's, it's sort of running the ER because because it has an ER, and, and you just need to attach the right sequences to your proteins to produce the correct compartment. Um, so to get a protein to the ER, the Golgi or the media, the first thing you need to do is get it across the membrane. Um, by the SET pathway, again, it's this major pathway for getting things across. SET pathway is conserved in, in organisms, in, in, in E. coli and, and in Tertia. It uses a slightly different signal sequence. It has three different kinds of signal sequences, so there's a proteroxidative saccharomyces cerevisiaceae, there are, um, there's an acid phosphate, there's an alkyl group, there's an alkyl group, and there's a methyl group, and all of those. Um, if you want your protein to be retained in the right compartment, you may need to attach other signal, uh, other sorts of signals to it. So for example, th there's an ER retention signal called the Azar signal. Um, and this is a sequence of the protein that allows the, 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 the trafficking machinery to recognize um, a protein that's in the, the Golgi as belonging in um, in the ER and, and can pass it back to the lumen. Um, I should mention that that's really important because, again, we're talking about post-translational modification. Depending on what compartment you're in, you have a slightly different post-translational modification. These glycosylates of proteins um, in, in, in the ER and that glycosylation pattern changes depending on what compartment you're in. So if, if you want to make secreted protein, the secreted protein will have a slightly different glycosylation pattern than the ER retained protein. And if that's important to you for your genome, then, then you should consider keeping the protein where it needs to be. Great. And, and that's all I really have to talk about. There's tons of literature you can, you can read um, if you want to read up about all of this stuff. If in the first place you look, there's, there's always manuals on gene modification, places like Pernega and, and Mass Biolab, um, or all of these places that sell biotech um, tools for producing proteins. But, but there are also a number of reviews um, out there and, and a number of, of, of research papers that might be interesting to look at. I just listed a few here. Um, there's a statistic, there's, there's a guide to Tertia pastoris, to Tertia pastoris. Um, there are a couple of papers I could on this 
about two years ago, I put up my hand up and asked the council to vote down the three area bylaw. Um, I think I, I still hear views which is which is also in the presentation and staff there and I can quote it. Another a slightly older but still very good review is Silver Castle Review that Dr. Thompson was on the final of. Um, a few years ago, I started talking about carbon catabolite repression. Um, that was that was that I put up a, a review about that. Um, so 